for sure there's meaning to it. Hebrews 13, uh, this would be the last message um, on the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, I'm going to read from verse 1 to 19. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you and more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. <clears throat> I could have read all the way to the end of, the, of the, the letter, but that's where it will end. And um, really focus on a, on a subject that... Um, uh, is actually quite profound. More I think about it, um, it, it, it's not easy to grasp, but as we wrestle with this idea, it, it really makes us think about what God has called us uh, in terms of our journey here on earth. Uh, the point that I'm thinking about is, is, is this, and, and it probably starts with a simple question, where is Jesus today? Where is Jesus today? Um, one answer, one answer that this letter is trying to, ha to, to offer is that this Jesus who died for our sins and this Jesus who didn't remain in death but who was resurrected, uh, he, this Jesus is in glory. He's in ascended, exalted glory in the heavenly place where God is enthroned. Uh, Jesus is called the one who is at the right hand of God. Well, we know that Jesus Christ, in, in a mysterious way, is God himself, right? Triunity, three in one, one in three. Uh, very challenging yet uh, profound doctrine that, that Christian faith offers us, uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, it takes a lot of um, thoughtful, thoughtful, um, faith-based thinking to kind of even get close to grasping this. But uh, here we're talking about Jesus who was sent by the Father into the world, who became a man, right? We're talking about not just a divine Jesus. We're talking about human Jesus. 
Uh, but this human Jesus uh, was, became the first fruit of resurrection, salvation at the ultimate form. So in other words, he's not just human like we are today, but he's a glorified human. He's, he's resurrected from the dead into a, a, a body and, and a living form that deserves eternal life or that is fitted for eternal life. One day we will get there too with him. But he's the first fruit. He's the representation. He's the one who already have gone through it. And this Jesus, the writer affirms, is our great high priest who is not serving in an earthly tent. He's not serving in an earthly uh, sanctuary or temple. He is in the heavenly sanctuary. He is in the Holy of Holies, the true Holy of Holies, not a model, not a replica of what is in heaven, but the real thing. So Jesus is in heaven in full glory, right? Representing us with his own blood. And this is an amazing thought. So even as now, as we worship, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God as the great high priest for us with his own blood sprinkled. He called each and every one of us by name, okay? Because scripture mentions about names all the time. He remembers us. He, our names are on his palms in a, in a sense. It's engraved there. Our Jesus is interceding for us that offers us the incredible privilege of approaching the throne of God, meaning entering into the Holy of Holies, the true one in heaven, with confidence, even though we are in many ways weak and sinful. Right? As forgiven sinners, as men and women who are called right or righteous or just, not because we really are, but because the true righteous and just one, Jesus Christ, offered himself as a sacrifice in our behalf. He gave himself so that because of his sacrificial substitutionary sacrifice for us and because of that blood that cleanses us, we stand before God as people that are cleansed, people that are righteous, people that are just, not by our efforts. That's Christian gospel, isn't it? We don't try to be good, think that that's going to get us anywhere. I mean, we, we try to live out our calling, but that is not an effort to save us. We don't save ourselves by trying hard. We don't save ourselves by being good. You know, that's not the basis of our acceptance before God, only because of Jesus, because of what he has done, what he had lived and what he had died on our behalf we find this incredible gift of salvation. Now we are approachable to God. Unthinkable. He's a holy God, and he's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of holy God, as, as a Hebrew, the writer said earlier. But we are able to approach God even though we know. We all know. Are we not sinners? We are. We are all sinners, but yet we can come before God because of Jesus, because Jesus is in glory as the great high priest who offered himself once for all, his blood and his sacrifice once for all, now continues to intercede for us that we may be found absolutely and totally acceptable by our God. That's, 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 that's the message of the good news. You know, you're not saved by your efforts. You're saved because of Jesus. And this Jesus is glorified Jesus is in heaven, exalted heaven. Okay, so that's one answer Hebrews offer us. Where is Jesus today? He's in glory. He's in heaven, interceding for us as the great high priest. But then is that all the story there is? See, what we find in our passage today is the second part of that story. That Jesus is glorified but as long as this world continues, as long as this age continues, Jesus Christ as the head of the church is not just in glory, but Jesus is present with his people where 
his people are enduring the hardship and suffering as an ongoing experience of this age. What does that mean? Well, it, it means this, that we're not yet in glory, are we? I mean, we already taste the goodness of the good news of the gospel. So hard times come, but I mean, we, 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 we preach the good news, don't we? In, in the most difficult times and difficult places, especially, like we are not people who despair. despair. We, don't, we don't lose hope. When we think there's no hope, we don't lose hope. We continue to hope that God will do his work of salvation, and that hope brings us an incredible experience of sweetness that the world will never offer us in times when everything seems really bitter, right? So there is that experience of salvation already here, but at the same time, where that experience of salvation is happening, we are living in the midst of the reality of trials and suffering. <clears throat> a brother David, in his prayer, mentioned about Albin, brother Albin Chang, who is a, a, someone who I consider to be an important partner in ministry, uh, but he passed away early uh, Saturday morning, just yesterday. Uh, his wife, a doctor, um, he, she also goes by couple different names because of this missionary masking identity stuff, but uh, her real name is Joni Chang, and uh, I've introduced her to this congregation once, I believe, and somebody who's working very closely with, with the, the ministry that we have uh, in, in, in China. Uh, and I mean, it's trying time. It's, it's a bad time, too. It just seems like an odd time for this to happen. If God was orchestrating this, why now? Why this way? It just seems really odd. Um, but we preach the gospel even now. I, I mean, I mean it, it's amazing that a sister, Joni, telling me that her husband just passed away, would write me a text immediately at that time as we share our grief she would say, my dear husband, I've been fought a good fight to the end. I am relieved that now he's resting in the grace of God. I mean, it's, it's amazing. At times like that, you could say that. I don't know how many of you have been following this, but I, I, I know that you, you, ha you have known this because I, I told you and prayed with you about it. But... Uh, our brother, one of our members, uh, Rich Chung, mom, is, has been battling with, with cancer, and uh, she's very near the time of being called. Um, I was there just a few days ago, uh, going through the final, in a sense, service, um, offering her soul, um, cleansed by Jesus Christ unto him. And it's sad. It's, it's tough. Um, especially when I see Rich's dad. It's tough. It's, it's hard. I mean, he's heartbroken. But even at that moment, it's amazing. Just completely, utterly amazing that he really finds comfort in the gospel in a time like that. I can't imagine that, to be honest. Losing a wife like that, who just accompanied him all through his, his adult life. But at that moment, I mean, just days ago, he was saying, I can't let this happen. But as we continue to affirm the gospel, talk about it, it's amazing his heart's graced by God's presence. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that, yes, it's the reality of suffering. Yes, but here is the gospel proclamation and application that cause us to experience the sweetness of God's glory. But nevertheless, it is the place of suffering where is Jesus today? As the head of the church, 
He is in the place of suffering with his people. See, that's the other side of the story. Jesus is in glory, but he's also in the place of suffering with his people. Okay? And the way the writer of Hebrews is reasoning is this. It's just the continuation of what he has done. Verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood, in order to bring salvation to his own people whom he calls by name. What did he do? He did not stay as the main guy in the city of Jerusalem. He did not go up to the palace or uh, the house where the governor was, the Roman governor Pilate. He did not go to a place of political, economical, sociological, whatever, you know, all these important place, importance, place of importance. Jesus did not try to climb up the ladder of success. But instead of that, in order to save his people, what did he do when he saw Jerusalem? He didn't rejoice in its glory or he didn't rejoice in his, its metropolitan grandness. He did not rejoice in the, in the you know, political centric kind of success that one may look forward to, but rather he looked at Jerusalem and he grieved. He cried because it was lost. He didn't try to save it by the worldly success. No, instead, what did he do? He took the cross and he went outside the city gate and he was nailed to the cross at a place called Calvary, a skull, that's the name of the place, outside the city. The writer of Hebrew takes this very figuratively but also very real, realistically. It's a figurative in a sense that him going outside the city, outside the gate means what? He didn't try to be in the main, mainstream of things. He didn't seek the, 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 the values that the world will consider important. He didn't try to impress people by, by being successful in the eyes of the people. He didn't, he didn't covet the political position, or he did not go even religiously to be powerful in some kind of hierarchy. Jesus was rejected. He voluntarily took this shame upon himself and died the worst death possible outside the city gate because he knew that that's where the real salvation was necessary. He went out to suffer. But it's interesting that this wasn't just something that happened in the past 2,000 years ago. But that's where he is still. Verse 13, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. What, 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 what strikes me is that expression. Let us go to him outside the camp. Where is Jesus? He's at the outside. Where is Jesus? He's out there where the suffering is taking place. Not at the center of power, not at the center of wealth, not at the center of worldly influence. Where is Jesus? Jesus is out there. So when you go out, you see Jesus. Let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Just as Jesus took shame of the cross, let us with him take that reproach. The reason for that is for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. The world does not offer us anything permanent. The worldly success is not our ultimate meaning. The money is not going to give us ultimate salvation. Here there's no lasting city. There's nothing permanent here. Everything is temporary. It'll be there, but it'll be gone. That's not what we look forward to. That's not the ultimate meaning that we strive for. 
meaning is completely connected to the end, isn't it? Telos in Greek word, telos means the end, but it also means the purpose or the meaning. In English word too, right? The end means the purpose. What is the end of man? What is the purpose? What is the mission? It's connected to the end, right? And if you cling on to something that at the end will vanish, if you cling on to hope that at the end will not be there, you're living a life of illusion, are you not? If you're clinging on to things you see now, knowing that it'll no longer be there at the end, then you're clinging on to a vanishing hope that really does not deserve that hope to be placed on. The end is that final city of God that he has prepared for us. So don't be so full of it now because you think that you made it. If you know that you are successful in many ways, okay, this, this is a great lesson, isn't it? Don't think that that's going to save you. Don't think that you made it, therefore. But think of that, even that as vanishing, even that as temporary, even that as something that is not permanent, it really isn't. That if you are there, use what you have as a way of living a life outside the camp. Whatever it is, think beyond your self-centered success. Think about where Jesus is. Think about what true Christian success is according to the gospel. Don't worry so much about fulfilling your heart's desire in the way that you think will be better than what it is now. See Jesus in your life. Look at where he is. Think about him. Go to him where he is. Don't linger in your own selfish ambition or your fleshly desire or your own illusion about what constitutes benefits in life. Look for Jesus. If you miss Jesus, you miss everything. You need Jesus at the end. I mean, you, threw him, you need him all the time, but particularly when everything gets burned up, as tests and trials will do that. And I think one of the greatest tests that happens to us is final days in our lives. What will remain? Nothing but your faith in Jesus Christ and what God promised to you eternally. So where is the outside? I mean, that sounds great, but where is the outside? Um, I'm, I'm just going to go through this quickly and uh, wrap up. Um, the living outside, living outside the city involves what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, this is his logic. What it involves is love. The world is not ultimately driven by self-giving love. The world is driven by many other things. And if you think that love is something that drives the world, a lot of times it's self-seeking love. It's selfishness. It's consumerism. Uh, it's individualism. That's not love. The love is self-giving love. Self-giving love. Let brotherly love continue. That's where the outside is. How do you live outside life? How do you live outside the city gate. This is how you do it. Okay? Number one, it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. It's an interesting word, hospitality. You know, hospitality in Greek sounds like, sounds like this, xenophilo. Philia is love. Philo means loving, to, to love. Xeno, you know what xeno is? What's a xenophobia? 
strangers, right? strange things, things that you're not familiar with. Xenophobia is you are scared of things strange to you, right? So that's where you have racism and all the other things kind of, you know, stemming from. You are, you are scared of anything that's different or new to you. But hospitality is not just going out with somebody you know well. Biblically speaking, hospitality is not just feeding your friend. Hospitality means loving a stranger. Zeno, philo, to love a stranger. That's interesting, isn't it? it takes going outside, doesn't it? Um, for many, many years, church leaders were so concerned about church growth. How do you grow the church? Uh, it comes with a very much the sort of um, market-driven economy model, you know? How do you, how do you make your church more marketable so more people will be there? And a uh, great church growth scholar named Peter Wagner used to say, well, you gotta, you gotta stick with homogeneity principle. What in the world is homogeneity principle? He said, you know what? People who are like one another will gather. So capitalize on it. So like-minded people gathers. Find a common ground where everybody will come and feel comfortable. So that was a big issue then. How do you have a homogeneous congregation? But when you think about it, that's so anti-church. I mean, there are certain things that we need some kind of commonality. I mean, we use language that, that we can communicate in. Um, but, you know, that's about it. We have people from different cultures, different ethnicities. I know it's kind of hard to have an immigrant church like we did 21 years ago and, and get, get to this. But still, nevertheless, we know full well in our heart, yeah, there, there, there is sort of a starting point, but the end point of a church is not that we become homogeneous, other than the fact that we have one gospel of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely right to have strangers among us. It's absolutely right to have people of diverse ages, diverse backgrounds, people of all kinds of different experiences in life. Because that's what church is. That's where Jesus is. Jesus is... Outside the city. What happens outside the city? Well, you have strangers. Think about it. How inviting are you to the people that you do not really know? What, what constitutes a healthy church? I think healthy church is not when you are just drawn to the same people all the time that, that you hang out with. And that's sort of what happens at Jubilee, I think. Are we a healthy church? I'm not so sure. We're striving, but... I don't know whether we're there. I don't think so in many ways. But I'm, this is not a word to condemn us or myself or you, but it's an encouragement. You know, what does it mean to go beyond your comfort zone? This is not easy. It doesn't happen automatically. Whoever said, you know, Christian life is supposed to be easy? Well, it's free in that. We're not saved by our own expense. It's at the expense of Jesus, but once we become his own, what does the scripture say? You're not your own. Honor, your, honor with your own bodies. Honor with all that you are. Christ, him. Live for him. Right? We've committed to that. We've signed up for it. We all said at the baptism, I believe in Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. Right? We did. I mean, are we, are we kidding ourselves? No. But in that case, what does it mean? We, we, go, we walk across the boundaries. And of all places, we got to do it here. Let the brotherly love continue. Whenever Scripture says brotherly love, it's among brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 3 says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. And this is not just random, like, exhortation to go visit prisons. You know what it is? It's, it's the imprisoned saints. These are Christians because of persecutions or all the other reasons are imprisoned, who are shut-ins. 
people who cannot get out, people who could be easily forgotten. Go outside the city. Go outside of your immediate concern for your own self-seeking interest. You gotta, you gotta think, break out of that and, and, and think about where is Jesus today? Where is Jesus today? Jesus is there with people who are shut in in the prison because of his name. Jesus is there in the hospital room who are immobilized by the condition of the day. Seeking out. Verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all. And I, I would say it, it's a bit of a stretch too, but whenever Scripture talks about application, it's hard to get away from the emphasis on the covenant family. Your, 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 your family is sanctified by God's grace. Your marriage is sanctified. Your relationship with your parents in the covenant bond that's sanctified, your relationship with your children that's sanctified. You gotta go outside the city, what does that mean? Well, family isn't all about comfort. Family isn't all about getting what I want. Family is probably one place you know that you really have to go outside the city to serve one another, it's not easy. And I, 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 I thought about this, this is a little conversation I had with my wife, and I'll tell you, almost like a joke, but it's serious. So the other day, it was just a couple days ago, wasn't it great when our kids were just young? Wasn't it great when they were just little kids and we were just having so much fun raising them? Oh. Uh, a lot of you are raising your kids when they're young. They're now pretty much on their own. But we thought if we just take them out through this period of you know, schooling and all the other things, we'll be so happy. Ah, oh, so great. But the next thing we realize is that now our lives are consumed with our, our concern for our ailing parents. I remember the days when Family reunions were about just getting together, 50 some of us, <laughs> enjoying what blessing we have and sharing how our kids are doing and just having a wonderful time. Our parents were just happy to be there with us. But now we have to think about the next step. It's hard. It's tough. Wasn't it easier? Wasn't it, wasn't it more fun when kids were young, when we were like younger by 10, 15 years? And my wife, rude awakening to me, she said, you know what, I really didn't like you then. <laughs> she said, you are an awful husband. You're a lot better now. <laughs> that didn't enter into my equation, right? So, but but her, to her, that was the nightmare. That, to her, she said, you know, I really hated the way you were then. You are not a good husband. You are not a good father. Well, now I'm too old to even argue against that, so I'm, I'm fine. So I, I said, oh, okay, I get it. So, I mean, the point is, it's never easy. <laughs> you never have a time where everything seems easy. Maybe it's an illusion. Maybe, maybe you think it's okay. Maybe you just have so many things in convenient kind of arrangement that you don't really think about it. Or no one's life is overbearing upon your schedule now <laughs> or your interests. Uh, you think everything's just casually okay, but isn't it wonderful that the scripture doesn't just take us all over the place? Well, go to, go to Africa or you know, go to Arab nations. Go outside the city. You know, go to some mountainous place in South America to share the gospel. Well, that's one thing we do when the opportunity comes. But the scripture says, go outside the city and take up the discomfort and the challenges of the life of the covenant family. I think this is brilliant. 
Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. I could continue on because a lot of applications here. But finally, let me just say, the writer of Hebrews says, don't be so concerned about being at the center of things where life will give you glamour and wealth and fame and whatever else that world will say, wow, you've done well. Unfortunately, Jesus is not there. I, are you sure you might say, well, doesn't Jesus also love rich people? Well, he does. But he calls them to a better state of mind. Are you wealthy? Scripture says, do not place your hope in wealth that ultimately will not last. Be generous. Give it away for the cause that is outside the city. Christ calls you this way, now, today. But this is where the hope is. This is the meaning, the life that God has called us. Continue on, brothers and sisters. Fight the fight. Don't give in to your self-centered, self-seeking, pleasure-seeking desire that is so much at work. Don't think there's an easy answer to life. Continue battling, fighting with Jesus. It's worth it because Jesus is there with you. That's a promise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise of Jesus being there. Um, Wherever that we may be, uh, it may not be a physical place so much as to where we need to go, but wherever we are, how do we go outside the city, outside the gate, outside the camp? How do we break out of our own centeredness? How do we do that, Lord? Would you teach us even now as we pray, as we bow, would you make us struggle with that question? We're not yet in glory, but in some mysterious way, our glorified Jesus is still with us in our suffering, in the sufferings of your people. Cause us to boldly step out for the sake of being with Jesus, because that is the greatest worth. As Paul said, I consider all things rubbish in the light of the, the unimaginable worth of knowing Christ and fellowshipping with him. Take us there, Lord. We also pray for those who are suffering immensely right now. We know you are there with them. Bless their ways in the times of needs. We trust that you are more than sufficient for us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.